Hello internet people and uh, welcome to another jaunt. Um, I'm currently, at the time of speaking, on the Isle of Mull in a little place called, as you can probably see there, Fishnish. However, however, I'm not staying on the Isle of Mull. Um, I got up quite early this morning, got a ferry to, uh, from Oban to Craigmuir on Mull and then came along to Fishnish and the next plan is to go back to the mainland which sounds a wee bit counterproductive <laughs> mainland behind me there uh, to a place called Loch Allen um, and then from Loch Allen I'm going to walk for about 6 or 7 miles um, around the titular Loch Allen uh, to a place called Ardtornish nothing in Ardtornish except a castle and not very much of that um, a ruin, right? but it is a logical place to start this story and this story is about Somerled, um, not perhaps the most well-known of Scottish historical figures, but a great, great story and a very, very influential person in, in history. If you've ever gone to the world's leading burger chain at any point, or even if you haven't, you'll have heard of it, the name MacDonald wouldn't exist without Summerled, because he is the progenitor of that clan, and also of the McDougals, which we've discussed uh, at length in the West Highland Way uh, videos. So, um, yes, his uh, descendants went on to be very influential, uh, and he himself created the title of Lord of the Isles, uh, a title still held, at least on paper, by, I think, Prince Charles at the moment. Um, however, a lot of history and this is going to be a series that's going to be running for a few parts from different places but the logical place to start it is our tarnish um, for reasons that I will detail later. So behind me you can see the second ferry of the day. It's a Malkin Var which uh, came in through this very narrow entry into Loch Allen which is where we are. And to get to our tarnish, we're going to have to walk all the way around this loch to get to <laughs> that little point of land over there. I really wish I could have brought the kayak. It would have made life an awful lot easier today. Look, okay, Alan, what are we doing here? Well, first of all, I'd like you to imagine, if you could, that we're about 900 years ago. Uh, so, 1120, thereabouts. And you live here somewhere there would have been a settlement probably over there you can see a big building over there um, that's a Loch Allen castle I believe so there would have been uh, clusters of dwellings here because this is a really good place to live if you're in this time it's uh, sheltered it's secluded if you're fishing it's about the safest place in the world that you could imagine sea fishing there could be a major, major storm out there in the sound of Mull and you'd get nothing here except maybe a few little waves. So, it's a good place if you're a fisherman. And the land, well, it's not great, but uh, you could scratch some crops, some oats, that kind of thing. Um, now, if we're going back to the year 1120, as I say, good place to be this. Or it would be, were it not for a small problem. The small problem being the Norse. So let's go back those 900 years. And in this lovely secluded loch, there was probably beached a longship or two. Say a Viking longship, although I believe Viking is more of a verb than a noun. So I'm just going to call them the Norse. Most of the ones around this part of the world would have been Norwegian, um, or what's now Norway. Uh, the Danes, who were very active as well, obviously, tended more to hit England and the uh, East Coast. So, anyway, we're going to assume that this is uh, Norwegians that are here. So if you live here, there's not really much incentive to better your land, better your prospects, become rich. Because if you do anything more than just bump along the bottom, the Norse are just going to take it off you. A little water noise here, a new waterfall, quite nice. Uh, I've got to navigate a gate as well. 
OK, where was I before I was rudely interrupted by a gate that I needed both hands for? Um, yes. You're living here. There's no point in making much of it because if you've got a surplus, the horse will take it off you and you don't want to attract attention to yourself because if you do, well, they're going to turn up, they're going to take your stuff, they're going to give you abuse, they're going to take your woman. That happened a lot. If you look at the genetic records for Iceland, you will see that most of the DNA, well not most, but a significant proportion of the DNA of the Icelanders came from here. So a lot of people got taken from here to Iceland. A lot of them against their will, I would imagine. So, anyways, not a good place to be, really. Unless you just want to scratch out an existence and wonder when the next raid's going to happen. Now, where's your lord? Surely, there should be someone defending you. Well, the lord are here, in 1120, there's an island. Fermana, to be precise. Fermana would have been quite a good place to start this series, but it's a long way away, and I wouldn't have known exactly where in Fermana to go. So, we're in Loch Allen, for a reason that will become clear. Aye, so the lord of this area was Thane of Argyll. Um, Gilbride, my name. Rather a weak man, by all accounts. He did make some efforts to try and reclaim his birthright. Got some men together from Ireland, came over, got beaten, went home, tried again. I think he was nicknamed Gillibride of the Cave for a while, because that's where he tended to spend a lot of time hiding. He tried. He wasn't much of a leader, by all accounts. And accounts aren't great, because we're going back a long way here. But... Why is this relevant to anything? Well, because Gillibride's son went on to become one of the biggest figures in Scottish history that nobody knows about or hardly anybody knows about which is what this uh, series is going to be about I know bits and bobs about the man called Summerled probably no more than most but I'm going to travel about a few different places a few different episodes and tell you what I know and when I'm going to these places I'll do a wee bit more research try and learn a wee bit more and hopefully we'll all come out of this knowing a wee bit more about Summerled, the Lord of the Isles. But I am currently walking around Loch Allen. I have to go to the other side. And uh, that'll take us to our Tarnish Castle, where there'll be a little bit more to see. So until then, or until anything else interesting comes along, I'll stop. Oh well, right, so... This is actually quite nice. Um, it would be a hell of a way to come just to go for a wee walk, but it's a nice walk. This just a little road, well, track, along the side of Loch Allen. Now, it does kind of lead me to what I was going to talk about anyway. Until quite recently, not sure how recently, but we're probably not going back all that far, this would have been the Loch Allen Road, such as it is. And that's pretty much in keeping with all of this area, all of the West Highlands really. Um, the roads, until 30, 40 years ago, were absolutely terrible. Many of them still are. But uh, if you go back further than that, 150 years, the, early, the only way to travel along the west coast of Scotland was by sea. And that's really important to this story. Because whoever controls the sea, controls the land. And at the time we were talking about, in 1120, I think I picked, the Norse controlled the sea. The Scots king, there was a Scots king, uh, David his name would have been. And I think David in 1120. If not, it was about to be David. David's certainly a big part of the story. David was quite a good king. Well measured by the standard of the Scottish kings. We had some right clunkers, so compared to them, he was pretty good. Uh, quite a religious man, built a lot of abbeys and stuff. Um, fought a couple of wars, but he never really came up here. And he didn't have a navy. So even if he had come up here to try and knock the Norse out of Argyll, 
and the other parts of the West Highlands and the islands. He could have come up, he could have knocked them off the mainland. As soon as he went home, they'd have come back. He didn't have a standing army, so he can't station troops. After a few weeks or months, the troops would just decide, fuck this, and go home. So, aye. The importance of the sea, very much part of this story, as I said. So about 150 years ago, uh, railways arrived. Uh, certainly in Oban, it was about that time. Which led to the growth of Oban as a town, and a bit of a resort town, and all that sort of stuff, because it became reachable easily by people from Glasgow. But uh, roads, not so much. I can remember when I was a kid, going up the West Highlands with my grandparents. Some of the roads were atrocious. Just single track things, but with, you know, buses and trucks and stuff on them. Uh, and that was just, uh, that was the road, the only road, one of the others. So to say that this would have been quite recently the road to Loch Allen is uh, quite realistic. A new one is up there somewhere. And just quickly, you can see here what I mean when I talk about how narrow the entrance to this sea lock is. Look at that. Tiny. Felt like you could reach out and touch the sides when the ferry was coming through. So, and up ahead here we've got, that's quite pretty looking isn't it? You fancy a wee house in the country. Imagine it might set you back a few bob, but very, uh, very picture skew. Anyway, nearly around one end of the lock, then you're down the other side and over to our tarnish. Okay, so I did a piece to, to camera at the castle itself. Uh, unfortunately, the mic wasn't switched on. Well, it was using the internal mic, so there's probably a little bit wind noise. So, a bit of a voiceover for this bit, really, uh, as the drone flies about for a couple of minutes. So, what we're seeing here is the sound of Mull, right? This would have been like the super highway of its day. All travel would have been down this stretch of water because it's sheltered, it's safe, uh, and it just takes people up and down north, well, the west coast of Scotland, north to south, uh, in the easiest way possible. So, uh, it's a very strategic location where we are looking at just now. Now, this would have been in the time that we're talking about, uh, in about 11, sort of 20, 11, 30, 11, 30 by the time Summerled would have got here, really. Uh, this would have been probably a longhouse uh, on top of the hill. It wouldn't have been a stone castle. Stone castles were a Norman conceit, and there only really was in Scotland at this point one, which was in Castle Sween, which is about 40 miles south. Um, worth a visit if you're ever in Argyll. But, yeah, this one here, um, we're looking at, if you, don't, you kind of imagine it as being maybe a, a wooden stockade uh, with a, a, a longhouse inside it. Um, and at the time when Summerled first got back to Ardtarnish, it had probably been burnt down. So one of the things that he did in his early years was make this a stronghold again. The castle, as you're looking at it just now, though, um, would have been built, well, probably in the early 14th century. Um, at that point, it would have been Clan Donald that had this land. There's a wee bit of history, which I'll just go over <laughs> as well, about this, because in the... Later years, uh, specifically the year 1461, uh, there's a slightly notorious treaty called the Ardtornish Westminster Treaty. Uh, and that doesn't need much explaining. You're looking at Ardtornish and you know where Westminster is. So, this was a treaty between John of Isla, the then Lord of the Isles, uh, and Westminster, obviously, by which John was going to become uh, an English subject in exchange for throwing his support behind an English attempt on the Scottish throne. So, um, high treason, essentially. And just after that treaty was signed, there was kind of a um, diplomatic relations softened between England and Scotland. Nothing was ever done. Okay, And then about 10, 15 years afterwards, the English told the Scottish king about this treaty, which didn't go very well, as you can imagine, for John of Isla. So, we're talking, and my reason for coming here, was to talk about basically the formation of 
the Lord of the Isles as a title and as a kingdom. And it started here when Summerland came back. It also ended here um, with the Treaty of Ard, Ard, uh, Westminster Ard Tornish because that was essentially the end of the Lord of the Isles as a title. But it's about three centuries. It had, it had a decent run. But let's talk a wee bit more about um, Summerland. So he would have come here as a young man, probably about the age of 20, um, with some Irish soldiers. And he would have started pushing the Norse out, largely by subterfuge, because uh, he didn't really have the numbers and he didn't really have the ships. But he captured ships and he got numbers because people started to join him. People that had been beaten and cowed started to join him. So this is the beginnings of the story and this is the best place to come to talk about the beginnings of the story because this was uh, Summerled's, sorry, Summerled's father's um, seat of power and it became Summerled's seat of power in the early days. We will see as we go that there were other places that, uh, that he kind of made more his home in later years but this is where it started. And... Uh, it's a good place for it. It's a lovely place. It's a lovely place to visit. Not the easiest place to get to, as I said, but it is a really nice place to visit. And uh, I think we'll just have a wee look at the water and finish up with a fly round. And where's the series going to go next? Well, it's a few places it can go. Isla is going to be one. And uh, Iona, possibly another one. Kintyre, there's a place there that's definitely relevant. And also another island, which is no longer in Scotland, but was uh, at this point, at least nominally. So all these places are going to get visited uh, as we explore the story a wee bit. I want to get a sense of where Summerled would have walked, where he, what he would have seen, because a lot of it's not changed. Um, and just try and get a sense of the man. It's difficult over nine centuries, but we'll give it a shot and <laughs> we'll see what we can learn and uh, see what we can find out about uh, a figure in Scottish history that probably isn't known uh, as well as he should be. You know, we all know about Wallace, we all know about Bruce, but uh, very few people know anything about Summerled. And I think as we go, you'll find that, hopefully you'll find that the story of Summerled uh, is at least as interesting, if not more so, than that of Wallace or Bruce. Um, probably worthy of a Hollywood movie, although you know, I wouldn't want them to actually do it because we'll just make a total arse of it. But anyway, anyway, if you know, if this is of any interest to you at all, um, the story is going to develop as we go, and it's a doozy. Um, and yeah, if you if you're interested in seeing a wee bit more, then hit the subscribe button or the like button, leave a comment, whatever. Enjoy the scenery, and thanks very much for watching. <laughs>